Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well. I wanted to try out a real-time painting style video for a bit of a change. I know a lot of people really like these on YouTube and so I figured I would try my own hand at one. Of course, saying that I am well aware that I decided to speed up this prep beginning process a little bit. I figured you didn't need to see me fight with lining up tape for like 10 minutes. But the plan for this real time painting is I wanted to just really have a chilled out painting session and try out my jelly cup gouache that I just reviewed recently um, and just play around with it a bit more and use it in a slightly more serious type of style of painting uh, because I know in that video it was long enough and I really only got around to doing more minimal tests and just sort of bare minimum painting and not too too diving in deep to a more finished piece of artwork with tons of layering and just you know more my style I guess you could say. For the paints themselves, I decided to look at my color chart and pick out the colors that I thought I would need in this particular painting and just scoop a bit out and put it on one of these palettes. This palette is actually the like upper part of a covered palette. Um, I just stole the top part out because I figured it would work really well for this. Yeah, I decided to scoop a bit of the paint out and put it on this palette just, well, I mean, for one, to save some desk space because that set is massive and takes up a ton of room on your desk, which I guess could be a downside to getting such a large set, but from my tests, reactivating it in something along these lines worked equally as well as using it straight from the cup in most cases and so I figured I would try it this way. It also meant that I could work with a more condensed color palette and I wasn't worried about the full cups themselves drying out, you know, if I was working away in sort of one session for like a couple of hours or whatever. Not that I'm that concerned about them drying out. I mean, they're massive cups of paint and I've heard from a lot of people that have had their sets a lot longer that they really do not dry out that fast and because they are such large cups, it really only sort of creates a film on the upper layer and underneath maintains that more gel-like texture with no problem. And here's the color palette that I'm going to be working with for this particular painting. There are a few more colors in here than I would have possibly originally pulled out, but at one point I thought that I might have actually gotten around to doing two paintings, which is why I split two pages in my sketchbook to have a nice clean border around them, but I realized pretty quickly that I was having possibly too much of a nice chilled out painting session and that one was going to be the maximum unless I wanted this to be like a four hour long video. Now I'm currently in a bit of a weird art mood, which I will get into because I decided that to make up some at least semi-worthwhile commentary content that it might be fun to answer some of your questions, and this sort of pertains to one of the questions that I'll be answering in a bit, so I'm not going to get too into it of my like current art mood situation sort of thing, but... Uh, because I am in sort of a weird sort of arty headspace and I was also a little concerned over the time of, you know, just the length of what a real-time painting video might entail. Um, you know, lots of people's art pieces can take multiple hours and I really wanted to keep this video around an hour. I feel like that's like a really decent real-time painting video. You know, you definitely can get the uh, real-time knowledge about a particular piece without it just dragging on forever. And so because of that, I was at a bit of a loss over what to do and like I said, somewhat at a loss idea-wise of what I felt like doing myself. And so eventually, I decided on trying out with the new gouache paints to do a Breath of the Wild landscape painting. Now I know landscape paintings aren't normally my thing, but I seem to be gravitating towards them a lot more lately. I think it's that I feel normally that more landscape style paintings uh, involve a little less precision than like a super realistic portrait and stuff. Like for instance, this 
painting, I did not even bother with an undersketch, which I cannot tell you the last time that I did not bother sketching in just a little hint of something to keep the overall proportions and stuff of the painting intact. So this was a bit of a wild choice for me as well. Might not have been the most brilliant idea to sort of slap two things that I don't normally do together in something I wanted to turn into a real-time video, but clearly I did it. And it also worked out nicely seeing as I did want to try out those gouache paints again because background style illustrations and gouache just look awesome, you know, they really have that Studio Ghibli kind of feel to them. But now that I've explained what I'm working on and rambled on an extensive amount in that period as well, let's actually get on to the questions that you asked me. Let's start off with what is my least favorite art medium to use and why? The first thing that came to mind when I read this question was oil paint. Now, I like never use oil paint, so I'm not entirely sure if that would count for this question, but it is what sprung into my mind first. And the reason why I never use oil paint is just the entire process, like in theory, oil paint would be a great happy medium between a whole bunch of paint aspects that I like and dislike from, you know, acrylic paint and watercolor and all of that kind of stuff. But just the process of using oil paint and the just the whole situation with the oil paint. I know that there's water soluble oils now and I might end up having to look into those, but just the whole idea with all the different oils and mediums and just precautions that you have to use and just, you know, don't mix in too much for your base layers and work up. It just, it just is a lot for me, especially because I'm used to just not really worrying about what I'm working with, but maybe I will have to pick up oil painting at some point because like I said, it does seem like a very appealing medium to use, but every time I look into it, I get a headache. <laughs> I don't know, if you really like using oil paints, how did you start out and sort of just get that first head start into being able to be comfortable with using the paints themselves? But as for the mediums that I do actually somewhat frequently use and am willing to use, I guess pastels, which again, I don't use that often, but I really like the look of them and I have very seriously considered looking and getting some pan pastels. Just pastels in general, it's just the mess. Let's be real. I'm sure most people, if you say pastel, their next thought in their head is mess but I really like the look of them and most of the time I am willing to put up with the mess if a piece calls for pastel or I just think the pastel would enhance a particular idea that I have. So overall, I don't mind the mess, but I think pan pastels might be an interesting way around the sort of general mess of a standard soft pastel. I do have pastel pencils that I should use more frequently, but I think a lot of the time it's just the the overall concept and thought of pastels just being messy, whether they actually are as messy as you think they are or not, just holds me back with using them more frequently than I might. Another question I got somewhat related to the art medium idea was somebody asked if I did digital art. And I do, or at least did, it just doesn't happen very frequently. I think one of the main reasons for me is I'm just someone that really loves the process of creating traditional artwork. And I don't wanna say getting your hands dirty as I literally just complained about pastels being a little too messy for me, but just the overall, you know, using your hands more. I don't know if you necessarily use your hands more in traditional artwork versus digital, but just the process of traditional artwork, I really like. And the feeling of using a brush and just having complete control over how the medium works. I know that digital tools and technology have come a long way with pressure sensitivity and trying to mimic that traditional look, but it's still not quite at the level of actually having a brush in your hands. That being said, the times that I have decided to do a digital piece, it's generally related to the technology and how it will assist me in creating a particular piece with a lot more ease than attempting to do it traditionally. And I do really love the look of digital artwork. 
just the overall precision and detail that you can get into because of course you can zoom into your canvas and sort of fix any problems which is also possibly a reason why I don't necessarily like it as much because I can be a perfectionist to a crazy amount in traditional artwork as it is. Having the ability to constantly be tweaking settings and adding layers and fixing things up, it just, it could be a nightmare for me to do digitally. Like it would never end. So I guess if I chilled out on the perfectionist tendencies and set myself some limits, it could be a possibly a pretty successful medium for me to use. But again, it's just that whole traditional art messiness that I really love to do. That being said, I actually use technology and digital art sort of components probably more frequently than most people realize. I tend to plan out pretty complex pieces if I'm deciding to do them and sketch them out digitally just so that I can move things around if anything needs to be moved around or maybe I'm not entirely sure about a certain aspect or it needs to be transferred onto like a wood panel or something anyway. So I do actually end up using digital sketches quite a lot. But for right now, that just seems to be where digital art fits into my current art style and workflow. Back to talking about the actual painting that I'm working on for a second. I decided to make the sort of first layers of this painting a lot more sheer and watered down. It's just generally a good idea if you're using gouache and plan on doing a lot of layers to do a more washed out sort of base layer, especially if you plan on layering on top because gouache does reactivate. So having a more translucent base to begin with means that that color is not going to be picked up as easily as if it was like a thick opaque layer to begin with. And that's when things can start to get messy and muddy looking. So that's the technique that I decided to implement for this particular painting at the very least. But back to the questions. How do you find the energy to paint when you're too tired slash depressed to get out of bed? Or do you allow yourself to take breaks slash not force art when you're tired slash depressed? Basically the idea of how do I possibly force myself to create artwork or find that motivation when I am not feeling motivated in the very least. Now, when I read this question, boy, I felt it. And I think a lot of us are going through that similar sort of headspace and just generally going through it, although some a lot worse than others. Generally, for me personally, I try not to force it. I mean, it really depends on the situation. And I guess at some point I do start to at least coax myself if it's possibly been a bit too long, but I am someone that generally likes to stay pretty busy. And at any given point, I can normally find something that at least interests me to start or at least try to work on. Although lately it's been real interesting. I've been trying to figure out exactly what it is and I think it's a slight combination of I possibly somewhat burnt myself out at the beginning of this whole sort of self-isolation quarantine kind of period because I know I mentioned this in a previous video. I had spent like multiple weeks working extensively hard on a couple of projects that still aren't finished, but they were supposed to be for a convention and then the convention did get cancelled, but I was going to pull out anyway. So that just overall relief of not needing to get them done immediately and not have to worry about that. And then all of a sudden this sort of demand or call for extra content online and, you know, keeping people entertained and busy and whatever that might have entailed for me, I all of a sudden started, I kind of did a complete 180. I was working crazy on these other sort of projects and then instead of, you know, taking it easy for a bit or just going back to a more normal sort of schedule, I 180'd it and completely went, made myself even busier creating YouTube videos. So I accidentally sort of ended up in a bit of a, 
burnout period. So right now I kind of cut back a bit on the content. I was like putting out two videos a week and they were not like quick videos. I was like working constantly. So I did decide to cut back a bit and just, you know, not worry so, so much about putting out so much content. Like obviously I am still putting out, hopefully you consider a good amount of content, you know, at least something a week, but just not killing myself over over doing a crazy amount of things in such a condensed period of time, at least for a little bit. Got myself over that sort of hurdle, you know, chilled out for a bit, didn't worry too much. You know, if I didn't feel like working on any sort of artwork or sort of figure out my next project, like, don't worry about it. You got time. You'll figure out something. I have a list as long as my arm over different video ideas that I can do at any point. So I don't really have to worry too much about thinking of an idea if it really came down to that. So took a few days to chill out and then sort of got to the point where it's like, you know, I do somewhat feel like working on something and it would probably be a good idea to work on something and just actually starting to work on something became a bit of an issue and I don't know what it is. It's not like I necessarily didn't feel like doing it and or Animal Crossing was keeping me nice and busy. It's just that anything idea that I possibly had or like possible painting ideas that I keep on a list of like whether I just don't have the time currently or I'm just you know a painting idea to save for a rainy day sort of idea all of those nothing was really jumping out at me and I think I figured out, for me at least, the reason why I was sort of having this mental hurdle and it's just I think came down to any possible artwork that I would normally do or I felt like kind of doing, it just kind of seemed stupid. And I know that's not like a good explanation about my headspace or whatever, but it just kind of felt like why on earth would I spend the time on this painting now when, you know, a, either there's like way more important things right now or like think about what other people are having to go through or just why on earth would I decide to make this piece of artwork right? Like what does this, who does this benefit? Like this doesn't benefit anybody or anything. And I know that you could say that, oh, I was planning on turning this into a video. Like it's going to benefit people in an entertainment value, but I don't know. It just, it feels weird and I never like feeling weird. I am always somebody that, you know, most of my artwork happens because I really want to make that and if something doesn't feel right, I'm not going to do it. Hopefully I'm articulating my thoughts to at least some degree in this, but I think just the idea of attempting to work on a larger piece just seemed like the most ridiculous idea in comparison to everything else that's going on in the world. Like these smaller sketchbook style pieces, I could just chalk it off like, you know, it's a sketch. I decided to spend like X amount of minutes or hours doing this. It's this insignificant piece of artwork. It means nothing, you know, it's this little doodly painting in my sketchbook, whatever, not a big deal. But the thought of going I don't want to say out of my way. I'm an artist. This is literally the entire point of what I do. But the idea of going out of my way and creating a larger, more complex, time-consuming piece of artwork just seemed like a really stupid idea. And it does still sort of feel like that. And I'm going to have to get over this fast because it is just saying this out loud sounds like a ridiculous thought process, but I'm sure somebody listening to this also feels that similar way. I guess overall, I just felt that 
for me spending my time on say making a tutorial or going through a process of something else other than just sitting down and me creating a painting that I either wanted to do or it was an idea that I had and spending all of my energy on that as opposed to something else that would possibly benefit more people in whatever minute way that might be with keeping them busy or whatever. It just it, it felt like a better idea and it does still feel like that. The idea that I think a lot more people get more value out of something like a tutorial or at least, I don't know, this, a lot of people might not feel like this, but I think that overall more people possibly get more value out of something that is educational, like a tutorial or something along those lines than a speed painting sort of style process or I know there is some educational value in those types of videos, but I don't know. It just felt like those types of content or videos possibly felt like they would benefit more people. And I guess that felt like at least I was doing something. Like I know in the grand scheme of things, me making a painting tutorial is really not doing a whole lot for a lot of people. I mean, I guess it's possibly teaching somebody an activity or keeping them busy or whatever. But you know, in the grand scheme of things right now, is learning how to paint a seashell really that important? Probably not. And I guess the overall concept of spending X amount of hours on this semi-serious piece of artwork and then deciding to put that up online in some form or another just kind of felt like a, oh, you're spending your time doing this must be nice or whatever. And it's like, I know people are like, you know, lots of people are picking up hobbies and stuff. So what, why should it matter that that's what I decide to do with my time? But again, this sounds ridiculous. This I think is just why my head is sort of where it is at at the moment. But I'm going to stop my rambling of my headspace there and try and get it back to something that might actually benefit or help some of you in regards to finding that motivation. Because there are definitely a few, I guess, techniques you could call them that I decided to do to kind of get myself back into a more creative, friendly headspace or just in the sort of headspace that I am wanting to start creating things again after a bit of a break. Because like I said, I generally don't push it. I mean, it kind of depends on why in particular I might not feel like making a piece of artwork or working on anything. Like, is it more of a health, like physical health issue. I know I mentioned this. I mean, men I think I've been mentioning this a lot more lately because of the current situation, but I am type 1 diabetic, so there is a physical sort of health issue there that can kind of, I guess, flare up, you could say. And so for health reasons, a lot of the time I might decide to not push it because pushing it could possibly result in me ending up even worse. Like maybe I'm just having a bit of an off day, like I'm not feeling great, maybe my blood sugar has been doing a bunch of weird stuff and so I'm just gonna decide to take it a bit easier that day and just kind of get myself back on track and in line with a better sort of situation for myself health-wise. But on the other side of that, I think that the biggest struggle I personally end up having is more along the lines of burnout. And for that, I have some particular strategies that I go about to get myself back on track. Like I have mentioned, I generally do decide to not push myself. I am normally a pretty intense worker. Like, I will have no problem working up to like 3 a.m. for like an entire week if I'm super into the project and just working myself to the bone constantly. So, I think that's a lot of the reason why I decide to not push myself because I know if I'm super into the project or passionate about the idea, I will just work until it is finished and sort of, I guess, not make up for the time that I might decide to chill out a bit, but I'm generally not chilling out that much. So any time that I actually feel like taking a step back and doing a more chilled out sort of not working situation is almost applauded in my mind. So that is why I decide to not push it and just give myself a bit of time. But after a couple of days, normally I would decide, you know, 
I get fidgety, I guess you could say. Like, after a couple of days, I will almost get, like, creative insomnia. So, if I'm someone that if I haven't worked on something for a while, I will almost not be able to fall asleep because I haven't fulfilled that creation itch in my mind. Apparently, this is a video where I just sound like I'm absolutely losing my mind by attempting to explain how my brain works. But yes, normally after a couple of days, I kind of have that whole relaxation idea out of my system and I am back to wanting to work on something. But there is the odd time, I mean, semi-frequent time where I have burnt myself out so bad that it's just still not sounding appealing after a decent amount of time. I think another sort of offshoot of this is the quality of your sort of break period or relaxation. Like, what is that quality like? Because I know a lot of the time for me, even if I am, say, spending the day playing Animal Crossing or whatever, I maybe feel guilty or I'm constantly worried about what my next idea would be. And of course, that's not necessarily an actual break or particularly relaxing. So maybe first get yourself to the point where you are actually like fully committed, like I am absolutely not going to be worried about doing anything for the day or the weekend or the next couple of days or whatever that might be, like actually fully, at least mentally commit yourself to like for the next however many days or whatever, I am not going to worry about any sort of artwork or this idea or worried about any kind of aspect of what might have been, in my general case, burning you out. So, do not worry about the next YouTube video, do not worry about your next idea, just actually relax. Like, do not maybe even particularly look at uh, comments or apply to those or emails, just actually fully check out for X amount of time. But even with decent quality relaxation, it can still definitely be a challenge to get back to working on projects. And that is when I start implementing some of my techniques. Now, for me, one of the first things that immediately I try to do to get myself back into feeling inspired and motivated is to actually feed myself some inspiration. Now, this can be very different for every single person. It really just depends on what inspires you. For me, a lot of the time it could be something as simple as watching either a new movie that's maybe been on my list of things to watch or an old favorite. I love doing fan art. It's a great way, I think, to possibly jump back into some sort of creative process or workflow. If you are someone that is inspired by more visual media, maybe you can even create a sort of art project for yourself to get yourself back into things. Like maybe your, I guess, bribery to yourself almost is, you know, spend the next two hours watching this movie and when that movie is finished, draw a portrait or whatever or a scene from that movie. Don't necessarily for, like worry too much about it being perfect. Just do this sort of activity for yourself. Just something to get you back into the creative headspace and just overall creating because I think, at least for me, just keeping the ball rolling is what keeps me rolling. So, if I just sort of stopped doing anything altogether and go back into more of a relaxation sort of mode, actually getting back into working is the hardest part, which is why I am someone that generally likes to stay pretty busy because it means I will stay busy and get a bunch of stuff done constantly almost. For me, I think the hardest part is actually jumping back into stuff because you can kind of build it up like crazy in your head and worry about all of these little things and just make it seem like way more of a big deal in your head than it actually probably is going to be. 
I guess it's kind of the idea of why Inktober is so popular. You know, it is a purposeful task that a lot of people do. And, you know, in April saying, telling someone to, you know, do a drawing every day might seem absolutely ridiculous to a lot of people. But, oh, Inktober is around the corner and everybody is doing Inktober. And there's this like set idea of either those prompts or whatever it might be. And a lot more people do it then. I guess for some people, the idea of structured activity is all it might take for them to create even more. So yeah, a lot of the time, all it takes for me is to watch a new movie or one of my favorite movies. And after that, I'm feeling, you know, really inspired and like I want to create some artwork for that. And so that's what I do. And that's kind of my first piece back into that whole creative flow of things. And I actually create a piece of artwork at the end of that movie watching activity which is also why, and I'm fully aware this is going to sound equally as ridiculous as half of the stuff that I've said, how my brain works in this video, I have figured that I actually end up starving myself almost for inspiration. There are particular movies and just different media that I will specifically decide to not watch because I know that it's probably going to make me want to create some piece of artwork and I either don't have time for it right then or I just want to put it off and wait for kind of a rainy day when I really need that inspiration. And this has actually happened a lot where I have found myself either possibly consuming too much media, I guess I would say, for what I would consider a decent amount for my inspiration levels and I kind of have too much work right at that point and so the ideas that I possibly have associated with that media don't get done or get added to the list and put off and possibly never end up getting finished because that immediate rush and thrill of inspiration over that particular thing is just gone because I know I've said this in a bunch of videos for me I think my best artwork is when I'm super passionate about it. It doesn't matter how obscure it might be, like I could draw something I've never drawn in my life, but I always think that the artwork that I'm super passionate about turns out a million times better than something that is a forced idea, which is also why I think I don't force myself because I know it's it's almost not going to be worth it. Like, yeah, I might have this piece of artwork, but is it really going to be something that I'm happy with or something that I feel like was worth my time as opposed to possibly taking that extra day to relax and the next day finding something that I'm super passionate about and it turning out 20 times better I guess it's the whole quantity versus quality sort of debate, but that's just how my brain works in regards to painting. The more passionate I am about the project, the better. So the whole starving myself for inspiration idea kind of goes along with that because immediately, you know, after you've watched this movie, like, oh, it's like so amazing, you're so excited about it, whatever, that rush is what could get you back in to creating things. But like I said, I know a lot of people probably don't necessarily get that rush from visual media. You know, maybe you're really inspired by nature. So maybe going out on a social distancing currently sort of walk might help you with that. Or maybe looking through a book that has a whole lot of artist's work that you really admire might give you that push of inspiration to want to get back into creating something. It's very important to figure out what exactly it is that inspires you because it will be very helpful at some point in your life, I'm sure, to sort of exploit that for your benefit. But that was just sort of the first vein of steps that I take to get myself back into creating artwork. I guess just an overall thought process is, I think it's really important to not sort of jump right back into everything like crazy immediately, like build yourself up a little more slowly. Like don't just jump back into your full workload. That is also an important step.
because it's not going to help you. It's just going to completely overwhelm you. So maybe for the first day back at whatever it is you might be wanting to try and create, you know, you set yourself like you are in charge of your own creativity time, let's say. So maybe you have finally worked up the nerve to start working on a piece, but setting yourself just mental steps of, you know, only worry about working on this piece for, say, an hour, and after that hour is up, do something else, like, or whatever amount of time that may be. Maybe it's, like, finish this initial sketch, and then once that's done, either take the rest of the day off or go and do another activity that you find enjoyable for an hour, a couple of hours, the rest of the afternoon, whatever that is. I find that on my slightly more off days that just this whole idea of taking more frequent breaks helps the quality of the time that I am actually spending doing a particular project, even though it might not be, you know, forcing myself to sit at my desk all afternoon, that hour or two hours that I do spend doing a task and the rest of the time doing another activity, the quality of work that gets done in those couple of hours far exceeds me forcing myself to do something for a longer period of time. I mean, at this point, maybe bribery with yourself would work very well. Just something as simple like, I'm going to make my favorite kind of coffee, sit down and do a bit of sketching. Just something simple. It doesn't have to be crazy or, I mean, I guess the idea of, you know, sit down for two hours and then after those two hours are up, go and say, play Animal Crossing since everyone and their dog seems to be doing that at the moment is a bit of bribery or along the bribery sort of vein of things, but sometimes that's just what it takes to get you back into the swing of things. Sometimes it's whatever it takes to get the ball rolling is what matters, because after that, the ball might just keep on rolling and you're back to at least a reasonable level as to where you were before. I know the specific question mentioned not getting out of bed. Well, just don't get out of bed. Like, bring your sketchbook to you. Just take tiny steps and don't overwhelm yourself is generally a great starting point with getting yourself back to creating things. Another thing I do sometimes is get myself to be busy doing something else. So, some people call it productive procrastination, but just for me, sometimes the idea of being productive, doing something in any degree that seems a little more meaningful than buying turnips and decorating your island, uh, can get you to the point of wanting to actively start working and creating things again. Sometimes all it takes is the act of playing around with paint, like maybe make yourself a swatch sheet or just the motions of using a paintbrush and using paint, even if you're just doing some sort of abstract crazy artwork and not worried about the particular subject matter or consistency of that piece. Like, don't worry about having to post it online or anything. Just make something for yourself and get back into the motions of using a paintbrush. Sometimes that, for me, is all it can take. Yeah, I think that basically covers my general main thought process and steps of how I attempt to get myself back into the swing of things and get myself motivated. But seriously, guys, right now, do not worry about pushing yourself. You are far more important than your artwork and productivity. So just really take it easy and do not push yourself too much if you're not feeling like creating anything at the current moment in time. Now that I spent forever talking about that pretty heavy question and subject, let's go on to something a little lighter. What made you a Star Wars fan? Favorite movie slash book? 
I've always kind of been a Star Wars fan, or at least Star Wars has always sort of been a part of my life, or it's been around me. I'm almost 24, so the prequels were coming out kind of in that childhood stage of things, and it's just always been something that it's been around me. I guess it's kind of like the Disney movies, you know, people, the kids aren't actively searching out those films themselves normally. It's just one of those things that's just always kind of around, and Star Wars for me was also like that. We actually recently found a picture of me, which I was aware that at one point I did dress up like Yoda for Halloween one year, but we did actually find a picture fairly recently that uh, solidified that whole concept, and it was quite hilarious. <laughs> especially because like a five or six year old me was already like way too tall to be Yoda. So yeah, I have always kind of been a Star Wars fan, or at least it's been a part of my life, but I really heavily got into it after The Force Awakens. The Force Awakens came out and kind of reinvigorated or just made me remember how amazing Star Wars was. And pretty soon after that, I spent an entire summer working on a pretty extensive costume project and kept myself sane and entertained by watching the entirety of The Clone Wars. And that is what really solidified it. And ever since then, it's kind of been a downhill Star Wars obsession. As for my favorite movie or book, I'm assuming in related to Star Wars, uh, I'm always someone that I never can really choose one particular favorite movie. There's not one that super stands out in my mind. I just love the entire universe and I sort of view it as one whole entity. That being said, the one that I constantly go back to as being sort of one of my favorites and one I always think about is The Force Awakens. Although, as a side note, I would strongly 100% stand by me saying that my favorite Star Wars is always anything that Dave Filoni is involved in. I would pick The Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels, the series, over the movies almost any day. It's not that I don't like the movies, but really my favorite Star Wars ends up being more in this series idea because you do see so much more of the universe and you do get to find out so much more than a two-hour movie gets to tell you. So yeah, other than book, I don't really have a particular favorite book. I haven't read a ton. I know there's like a million Star Wars books and I actually haven't read a whole lot of the ones that people generally end up saying are kind of the more famous and best ones. So there's not one particular book that I'm like is my absolute favorite. I've enjoyed various ones at different times. On to the next question. On average, how long does it take you to do a piece of art from concept to finish? Same question, but for a cosplay piece. For both of those, it really does depend on the project. I guess we'll start with art. A lot of the time I have a concept in mind, so it's not like I'm sitting at my desk brainstorming for like three hours trying to come up with a concept, so that does generally save me a decent amount of time that I've already sort of have in my mind how I want a particular piece to turn out, so I know vaguely what I want it to look like, probably what uh, materials or what medium I want to use, possibly because I do have a fairly solid concept in my mind, what size that it's going to be. So for, say, a portrait, like one of my more splashy, surrealistic type of portraits, I would say, assuming that I know, have like a pretty solid idea in my mind, it probably doesn't normally take me more than an hour for the sketch. Again, it also depends on how good or bad of a drawing day I'm having that day, um, but assuming it's a pretty average or good to average drawing day, I would say I probably don't take more than an hour to sketch it out, depending again on the amount of detail that I'm putting in there. If I'm planning on doing any 
inking or line art sort of process as part of that portrait. That could be a half an hour-ish, say, and for the painting itself, generally the more surrealistic and splashy types of portraits only take about an hour of actual painting time. The only reason I really know any of this is just from filming myself so frequently, and it does take longer than that to completely finish the piece because of a dry time, but the amount of time that I actually spend with the piece at my desk for painting wise tends to, it very rarely is closer to two hours. It's generally around an hour. If I'm doing something in colored pencils, I tend to build the color up more slowly, so I'm possibly coloring in with colored pencils for up to two hours, again, depending on the amount of detail and the overall size of the piece. If it is a more complicated piece, there's normally additional steps. Um, if it's generally a more complicated piece for me, I'm starting possibly with a digital sketch, so it possibly takes around the same amount of time depending on the detail, but then I'm generally printing out that sketch to then transfer onto, say, a wood panel or a sheet of paper. So that's additional time onto that. It could take me up to an hour possibly to transfer the detail. And generally, once you transfer that sketch on, you have to, at some, to some degree, uh, redry it again almost to make sure that the uh, transfer paper doesn't just smudge everywhere. That's why for slightly more complicated and large pieces, I do really enjoy using a mixture of both watercolor and colored pencil because I can knock something off like um, one of the Women of Star Wars illustrations. Um, I'm not entirely sure how long it took me to draw those. The concepts were, again, already figured out. It probably took a bit longer to draw them since they are sort of a portrait and an image within the portrait, um, but as far as painting goes, they almost all of them, they're like 11 by 17, I think, so they are on the larger side. Uh, all of them pretty much only took me about four hours to color in. It was probably like about an hour and a half-ish of painting time and then maybe two hours of coloring and half an hour of just refining detail. So overall, I would say for the, the detail and the realism of those pieces is, I feel like pretty good. I could, they're a couple of years old now, so I might be able to bang them off even faster now. But yeah, it really just depends on how I'm feeling that day, I guess, and the details of the piece itself. Because sometimes I will, especially with colored pencil, I will like really take my sweet time just building up those colors and trying to make it super lifelike. But even those extended painting times are absolutely nothing compared to the time it takes for a cosplay project. Again, it really depends on the specifics of the particular project. Right now, I'm generally focusing more on screen accurate uh, recreations of certain costumes, but even within that, um, the last two projects that I have completed, one was a live action character and one was a cartoon. And even though they are both screen accurate, there's lots of differences between the two. I have also created like fully original cosplay projects, which can almost end up taking less time, even though you have the additional time of creating the concept and sort of working out all those specific details. Because you are in charge of those specific details, it can be more forgiving time-wise, I guess you could say, because it is up to your personal preferences more than attempting to screen accurately recreate something. But there are a few steps that, regardless of the type of cosplay project, are pretty universal. The first one is generally after I have possibly considered wanting to create a cosplay of a particular character or whatever, just kind of going through the 
slight details, just basically mentally thinking about how I am possibly going to actually go about creating this. And it's not even necessarily writing things down, it's just kind of a mental checklist of figuring out exactly how I might go about doing the particulars of the costume. So for instance, Embo, who is an alien character from the Clone Wars, just without even looking at into the specifics of his individual costume pieces, I kind of immediately went, you know, let's see what possible 3D prints there are of things, which is not a technology that I had originally, but it is something that I am attempting to implement more in my work. So first step, let's see what I might be able to print and sort of go from there. So it's like, oh, there is this really awesome 3D print mask that I can use. So that solves that problem. But then after that, it's like, well, that hat's going to need to be nice and light. So I guess we can knock that out with foam. That collar can also be foam. Obviously, the different pieces are going to need to be fabric. I can make myself look like an alien by adding some green sleeves into a t-shirt, basically. You know, he's going to need gloves because he's got three fingers that are extra long and all of that kind of like not worried too much about the specifics, just kind of going over the general game plan of how this might actually become a thing. Same thing happened with Emphis Nest. Got home, I think I have, I'm not even sure if I've told this story. Got home from seeing Solo, Emphis Nest had already been a character that I was interested in, just the overall character design of the armor. It just, it was fascinating. Got home from the movie after my mom had already asked me like, after I had drawn a picture of Emphis Nest, like, oh, is that something you're gonna plan on cosplaying? And I said, no, it's way too crazy. Yeah. Got home from the theater and said, guess what we're gonna try and do? And so even then, it was the, like, immediately after I had decided mentally that I was going to attempt to do this, I figured out how I was going to solve the seeing issue in the helmet with the visor because it's basically like a quarter inch, half inch line normally. Figured out that visor issue. I guess I kind of normally go to what might be the biggest problem in a particular costume. And if I can solve that, then I can probably solve the rest. So I guess jump the biggest hurdle first. And for me, for Emphis Nest, it was the issue of seeing through the helmet. And so pretty much immediately after I was looking into possibly doing that, I figured out how I was going to solve that issue, which was to use a ski goggle as the silver part, which meant I could see through the entire thing then. And after that, it was downhill from there, which it absolutely was not for that costume. It was chaos tenfold. And as for the specifics of that costume, I would say I sunk a good hundred hours into that and that was a non-stop two months of work for me. And that was just me building the props, like, because I am not the sewer. My mom was making any of the fabric clothing costume, actual costume parts. So if I was doing that, it would have been even longer as a one-man show, but it thankfully is not. The helmet itself took me an entire of those months. It was split up over a bit of time, but literally four out of the eight weeks that I was working on that costume was on the helmet. And for that, it's not even particularly prop heavy. I basically made the helmet, the Electro Ripper, which yes, is a large prop, but the pieces themselves did not necessarily take that long. Sculpted the teeth, the van braces were more on the complicated side, but we're not talking about like an entire suit of armor. There were just specific bits and pieces. But if you look at a character like Embo, who is an entirely alien creature who has even more armor involved than Emphis does, like already have to make myself an alien somehow. He has a ginormous hat, a ginormous collar armor, he has an entire vest plate, uh, front and back plate armor, and a ginormous weapon on top of just various other little bits and pieces. Embo I knocked off in less than a month. 
And it could have something to do with, at that point, I was a lot more experienced and I had already figured out exactly how I was creating everything and it wasn't that much of a shock or I didn't really have to problem solve in the same way that I had to possibly do a bit with Emphis. But I would say that I, I definitely worked on more individual pieces on Embo than Emphis and clearly did it in like half the time. But there are always a ton of different aspects that take up time in a cosplay project. Like, sometimes you have to literally figure out how you are physically going to be able to do something. So, for Emphis, there is a decent amount of electronics in the costume. Like, I had to research how to, you know, have a voice changer in the helmet and figure out how I was going to incorporate that in the design of the costume. Uh, LEDs now are like nothing, so soldering up some LEDs onto a 9 volt or adding fans in the helmet is like not a big deal now. It's kind of just a given as to how I'm doing that, but it's all the little, the little new projects that take up the time. And any of my live action screen accurate projects, an entire part of that process is researching the specifics of that costume. Like, I can tell you Pretty much every part of Emphis Nest costume, either what it is made out of, um, if it is a particular item that they possibly repurposed, like the greebly little bead things around or a particular type of connector. I know exactly what boots that they used. I know exactly, I actually have the exact same gloves that they modified for her gloves. Just all of the kind of nitty gritty things that I am particularly picky about, but the idea of creating a screen accurate costume makes you have to be picky about those specifics. On the other hand, when it is not a live action screen accurate character you're trying to portray, you are figuring out the possible logistics of how to turn that cartoon or animation into real life. So for Embo, immediately that was any of the design work on the scarf and the skirt, like the sash section. I figured that if they decided to put Embo in a live action movie, that would probably be all embroidered. It's not going to be painted on. It's not going to be printed on. It is going to be high quality looking embroidery and just the overall just thinking about how Lucasfilm or Star Wars, like how they would translate animated characters into real life or just generally how it's doable. I will say now I am probably only going to get faster because I'm starting to use a lot more 3D printing in my costume projects. I mean, if I can, because some things you just have to make yourself. Um, and a lot of the time I'm getting my 3D printer to possibly print things that are going to take like five times the amount of time that it would take to print it than if I actually made it from scratch myself. But for me, it's the idea that that printer is printing it on its own. Like, yes, I'm setting it up and I have to know the correct settings and how to use the machinery and make sure everything's gonna fit good and all of that kind of stuff, but that printer is making that piece of armor or whatever it is, well, I can then go ahead and work on something else. It's basically like having a second set of hands or even third of set of hands at this point because now I have two 3D printers. So, just allocating certain tasks to uh, my 3D printer to save me from having to spend the time to do it myself, even if it is going to take like a stupid amount of time. Like I have, I mean, I feel like it's not that much of a spoiler now. I have half finished a Cara Dune costume and almost all of the armor is 3D printed and it slightly pained me to 3D print so much of it, especially because like, for instance, the chest plate I think took like 10 or 14 hours and it's something that I could have easily made in like two tops, I would say, like pretty much looking the exact same. But because I wasn't actively working on it myself, it meant that I could have my printer be printing all of the armor pieces while I was still trying to work on other things before I even basically started working on the rest of the costume. 
So yeah, the timeline for cosplay projects are really just all over the place. I guess as a general timeline breakdown, first step once you have possibly considered a cosplay project is figuring out all the little hijinks that might come up. Once that's done, your research into the specifics of the individual costume pieces and if it is a screen accurate costume, possibly looking into if you want to buy those specific pieces themselves or possible alternatives that are going to be very close. That can also mean waiting on those materials to show up or waiting on finding the right ones. There's also buying the materials, you know, hunting them down down, going fabric shopping, seeing if you can actually get something that's going to be close enough to what you need. And once that has all finally happened and figured out, then of course starts the actual building process, which depending on the specifics can take a while. And there's of course also dry time, which I feel like is slightly overlooked. Sometimes you physically can't work on a piece for a while because something has to dry. But in a prop making sense, once it is built, of course, then it is painting time once it's been primed appropriately, which is about the only part of that process that I am fairly confident in saying generally does not take me a crazy amount of time, or at least I have the best grasp of an idea of how long the painting is going to take me. And this is, of course, assuming that things go smoothly and that you don't need to rethink a possible plan that you originally had, because then add even more time onto that. And once your props are all good to go, you could be possibly having to wire up some electronics or just generally finish it off with a spray coat or whatever that might be. And that's just the prop side. Then for the whole sewing side, there's just, you know, a lot of the time you have no pattern to work off of or you are finding a pattern that you have to alter extensively to fit and work the style that you actually need it to be. And there's of course fitting and just a whole lot of craziness on the sewing side that just adds even more time that I'm very thankful I don't have to be extensively involved in a lot. So yeah, overall timeline wise, it really just depends on the details of your specific project and the complexity for the individual pieces. I'm gonna speed up this last portion just a little bit since I'm spending a lot more time just refining a bit of detail and I think you're still gonna get the same idea if it's sped up just a touch. And the last question that I'm going to answer, seeing as this painting is coming to a close, is what is my dream project? I did think about this for a bit because I do have two pretty distinct but very opposing answers. The first one, I'm sure it's not going to be any surprise to a lot of you, I would love to work the prop department on a Star Wars project. And like, it wouldn't even necessarily have to be anything particularly exciting. Like, I could be slapping fake mud on a stormtrooper helmet and it would be a great day for me. The other thing that somewhat immediately came to mind is I would love to design like an album cover or merch or something for an artist that I really love. No one necessarily in particular and I don't really have any particular ideas, but just being involved somehow in a more artwork creative process for a particular musician would be awesome. Especially now I feel like there's a lot more artists that are using illustrative or just more artwork based as opposed to photography based album covers that would be super cool to paint something or just design something for somebody whose work i'm really obsessed with and i would love to know what your personal dream project idea would be because i'm sure there's a ton of really cool projects and ideas that i haven't even thought of that would be amazing to be involved in and to wrap up this video, let's go back and actually talk about this piece that I'm working on. I decided to keep things pretty loose and painterly. Most of the painting, like 95% of it, I did using the exact same brush, which was a number six round brush. And then eventually I went back in with just a number four, just because there were some areas, uh, the smaller like tree areas and just the smaller details in the guardian statue in the front there that could have used just a touch bit of a smaller brush but again I wasn't too concerned about like absolutely specific details like making sure to get absolutely every line down and every minuscule piece of detail in this landscape. 
But yeah, overall I'm pretty happy with how this piece turned out. It was a lot of fun and I definitely can see myself going back and doing more of these smaller landscape studies where I'm not concerned about any sort of under sketch and I'm just painting down the details and the gouache does help with that as well because you can, if you happen to make any bit of mistake, just go back and kind of fix that up with the paint as opposed to watercolor where you're subject to its translucent properties and fixing mistakes is not easy. I will say I probably could have gone a lot faster. I was kind of waffling around in the first half and just possibly taking my time a little too much. I probably could have built up the colors a lot faster. I was again just kind of getting myself back into the swing of using gouache again and obviously gouache does like to sink in and change color a lot more than some other mediums. And then of course it was time to remove the tape. Now I had to go in with a tiny little exacto knife here just because I ended up sort of taping up these two pages at the same time and I wanted to keep the tape on the one so just took a little exacto knife and did some slicing of the tape down the center so that I could just remove this one side. Ah uh, yes, those lovely edges that this masking tape and any masking tape gives a painting. I know it's slightly wasteful to be doing a landscape sort of portrait in a square sketchbook and allowing so much white around the outside, but it just looks great. I don't know, I really like the look of a more horizontal artwork in a square sketchbook with nice clean edges. And once I had the tape off, I decided to go in with a bit of white and just try and whiten up some of the areas. I felt that once you actually could see it beside a white background, it just wasn't quite bright enough. And here is the finished painting. Thank you so much for joining me through this first real-time painting process video of mine. If you would like to see more of these videos in the future, let me know. But thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in my next video.